more. Um, I, um, hi everyone here and everybody online. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this weekly seminar in food science and nutrition. It's co-sponsored by the Department of Food Science and Nutrition and the Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute. We are so extremely fortunate to have our speaker today. I am delighted and honored to introduce Dr. Valerie Bluebird Jernigan, who is a professor of medicine and rural health, director of the Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy at Oklahoma State University. Uh, Valerie, we just realized, has her PhD from the same place I do, Berkeley, which is like one of the greatest places <laughs> in the world. So uh, we have that connection. And I think Valerie's going to give you a little bit more uh, information about herself. I know Valerie through the Native American Nutrition Conference, where Valerie spoke, I think, at our first conference mm -hmm. and has come to subsequent conferences. And uh, so we've gotten to know each other a little bit. And she is really one of the most outstanding indigenous researchers who focuses on food sovereignty and health issues in Native American populations. And I'm delighted to introduce her. And the title of Valerie's talk is Using a Food Sovereignty Approach to Improve Health Among Indigenous Peoples. Dr. Jernigan. Thank you. Oh, before, before you start, I wanna give you a little gift. So we have a small gift from you, for you. It's um, a lovely, I have one of these myself, very, very fuzzy University of Minnesota program. And it really, it's like a Sherpa feel, they call it. So this is for you. Thank you. Very Take much. home so you never you forget your time here and speaking. Well. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Mindy. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Yako K. Halito. Chimchukma. Ohoyo. Chada. Valerie Bluebird Jernigan. It's really wonderful to be with you today and to be with the folks online. I am also a little intimidated by this huge, wonderful setup I have here, so I hope I can push the right buttons. I'm going to be talking with you about food sovereignty, the approach and the use of actually randomized trials in combination with food sovereignty, if you can believe it or not, if that is even possible. Well, it is, and I will show you some of the work that we have done. I want to start by thanking our hosts here, the Dakota people whose land we are on. And I'm a visitor here, and I want to say thank you for having me. I want to thank Mindy, and I also want to thank Elder June Blue, who is actually someone I had the great privilege of visiting with last night and um, had a wonderful dinner with. So I was gifted some wonderful tobacco from you. And I want to say thank you, Yako K, for that gift. And it's very meaningful to me. I want to thank you, Mindy. I've known Mindy for quite a while. I've had the privilege to work with Mindy on all of her work behind the scenes which is often thankless work. I know the amount of effort you put into making those conferences really the best national indigenous food conference that we have. Thousands of people go to every year. So I consider those conferences as a key part of my learning. And so super excited to be invited to anything that you host. Um, so thank you, Mindy. I also am going to be talking today about some research with partners, and I want to acknowledge the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, which is actually my tribe, um, Chickasaw Nation, I think we might talk a little bit about Chickasaw, Osage, and our funders. We have been fortunate to receive funding from NIH and the Office of Minority Health, so I want to thank these folks. and also want to say something that one of my partners in research, Tara Madri, who's here, often says Tara is a 
next generation researcher, she often says when she pre presents that she's community made. And I love that. And I want to also um, borrow that because it, everything that I share is really this information that I've been taught and learned um, from generous, mostly elders and community members. So it's nothing new that I've developed or created. And I really want to acknowledge that it's part of a community um, process. I, as I said, I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation and I'm a prof professor of medicine. These are some of our partners. In 2019, we launched the Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy at Oklahoma State University. We actually were really intentional about launching OSU's Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy um, in Tulsa and at OSU specifically because OSU launched the first ever tribally affiliated med school, the OSU College of Medicine at Cherokee Nation. So when that was happening, it was a really big deal and it was really big news. And I wanted to work in partnership with this native nation. And so that's where we chose to launch our center. And we really do work that is Western sort of funded because a lot of our funds come from National Institutes of Health. I was trained at Berkeley and at Stanford in a very Western mindset. Parallel to that, I was fortunate to also learn from community about indigenous science, indigenous ways of knowing. And so how do we use these two perspectives to support the best possible ways to achieve health is really the whole point of the center. And these are some of our many partners in the work that we do. I start with the slide about indigenous food sovereignty because that is really at the core of what we're talking about today. What do we mean when we say indigenous food sovereignty? It's often described as the right and responsibility of indigenous people to healthy and culturally appropriate foods produced through traditional indigenous practices. And what do I mean when I talk about responsibility? I think that this might be common knowledge, but we have as Native people really different perspectives on food and on land than you might see in the nutrition sciences training or field in the public health field. We see the plants as our relatives. We see the gift of food as a sacred gift, and it is our responsibility to care for that gift. And so we have rights, but we also have very important responsibilities. And so at its heart, food sovereignty helps us to restore those relational responsibilities. And in doing so supports some of the things that we want to achieve in public health. For example, restoring traditional food practices, healthy eating, reducing dependence on packaged foods, fast foods, which in native communities are often, the fast foods are pervasive. Um, so food sovereignty at its core supports that. And most importantly, food sovereignty is a movement that is embedded in an indigenous perspective of wellness and health, which if you research the scientific literature, you will see that indigenous models of health are largely excluded. We don't use them to understand behavior, to understand um, community change, community health. We need more of the indigenous models in our work. This is the slide that explains why we need more of the indigenous models in our work. And I've done my fair share of publications, several of which are actually with Tara. And I think Mindy has helped to really get a lot of publications out in journals, um, 
on these disparities, they are significant and we carry as native people a disproportionate burden of these disparities. Food insecurity, I probably started to study because I grew up in a food insecure household, going to bed hungry and eating commodity foods. And this is still the case for, in my community, over 60% of native people. So if we think about that in the mainstream US population, that level varies, but it's about 10%. If you think about a 60% rate, I mean, all the health outcomes that come from that, it's really striking. And our research has published, you can look on our website, indigenoushealth.com, but we published a lot around food insecurity. We published a lot around the um, independent associations between food insecurity and diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity. I was trained in cardiovascular disease risk. So when I came upon these numbers, I guess I wasn't surprised, but you know, behind these numbers are real people. So, um, you know, that is the, that is the work. They are our relatives. This slide sort of represents the transition that I made professionally and personally into the work from a more Western to a more indigenized approach. The far left is a photograph of sort of the ration distribution um, after native communities were sort of disrupted and moved from our homelands. We were often placed, I know Choctaw Nation and many other tribes in Oklahoma and other places where we didn't have access to our traditional foods and essentially our worldviews were disrupted as well. And so we relied on government rations and the modern version of that became the commodity foods. I love this comic book illustration of Sean Sherman, who's here. Um, his statement, my ancestors would have known the purpose of these native plants, but I had to start at square one. Were these plants used for food, medicine, crafting, or are all three? Many of us did not grow up with access to these foods or even knowing what they were, knowing their names or where to find them. So we had, you know, to start over. And I think in my research, that was very important for me to do. If I were to be a serious scholar doing work with native communities, I really had to begin the process of looking at what this actually means on a real day-to-day -day basis. Um, if we are to move beyond handing out pamphlets that say, let's use the DASH diet, it reduces, you know, hypertension. What is, what are we asking people to do in reality? And so um, these are some pictures of a traditional Choctaw garden that was started and harvested by one of our programs that we support at the Choctaw Nation Cultural Center, the Growing Hope um, program. And so that's sort of my journey. Um, and I include this photograph, this series of photographs as well, because I was just telling Francine the story about, this is what restoration looks like. And for native people, this is the picture of what restoring health looks like. And you have my 12 year old daughter making banaha, which is one of our traditional foods, it's very prestigious to bring this food. I don't know if prestigious is the right word, but it's very high status. If you can learn how to make this food, you have to make it by hand. It takes a long time. Um, the recipes aren't really written down. You have to be taught. Um, the reason it takes so long is because you take the corn, you um, grind it, then you, after you've grown it, you grind it, and then you add water, <laughs> you add some salt, you make the, uh, the dough and then you wrap it in the husks. So it's incredibly time intensive. And we used to cook it before we were relocated. We used to cook it with other ingredients besides corn, but we didn't have 
many ingredients besides corn after Oklahoma, we, we moved. So when we started making it just with the corn, it became known as no relatives. That was the way that the elders referred to it. So those of us who are relearning how to make it are making it and we're including the relatives again and we're putting beans and sunflower seeds. And so that's how we are, we're doing it. And the 12 year old there is cooking it with some sunflower seeds. We have this incredible abundance of lived experience knowing that food sovereignty works, but as a scientist, there is an absence of food sovereignty um, research, quote unquote. Um, you know, the evidence that food sovereignty um, as an approach can improve health um, is very is very limited because it's all anecdotal community initiatives. And my goal has been to move beyond these conceptual initiative, these conceptual linkages, which are, I love this model and I'm a, I'm a theoretical model, conceptual model junkie. So I could hold do a whole presentation with only models and geek out on it, but I won't, I will not do that for you. Um, I love this one because it's one of the few that in, in actually includes the, the, the word food sovereignty and its relationship to food security. But how do you, how do you do that? I mean, how do you take food sovereignty practices and how do you examine them in the context of a randomized control trial? What would that look like? So that's kind of where we started our work. We started to do those things. And so, um, I'm going to share the evolution of my RCT research at, funded by NIH. The first big RCT I led was the Thrive Study. The Thrive Study was a pure labor of love and really started at the heart of activism because the Thrive Study was a healthy retail study. And I presented on this at the conference. Um, it's finished now, it finished, I think a year and a half ago. As a researcher, we are not just learning from our science with the community partners. We need to learn within ourselves. If we really believe co-learning, if we really believe that you have something to teach me, just as I have something to teach you, then we should both be learning. My question was, can we source and sell healthy foods without hurting revenue and sovereignty in Choctaw Nation we were dirt poor until the 90s. And when we started building casinos and convenience stores, which these are some examples, we started to get some revenue. We started to get some jobs. And nobody wants to let those things go. Nobody wants somebody to come in and say, hey, we should not do as well in these convenience stores because the food you're selling is unhealthy. So. I had to approach this study. Can I do a healthy retail intervention without hurting revenue? And that meant that understanding that the data that we had showed that 60% of the native people shopped at these stores for food three or more times per week. So if you think about getting the bulk of your food at a convenience store, you really have to imagine how you might feel with that as your main source of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So to do this, we got incredible access to tribal receipts, sales. We got, we spent two years in intensive community-based participatory research partnership to be able to go into the stores and source and sell healthier foods. This is the RCT for the people that want this, the science of it, the, the real, you know, what, how did you set it up? This is the design. Uh, Native led from the research question all the way to the dissemination we published with our partners. Uh, cluster control trial, eight stores, four randomized to intervention, four control. This is a longitudinal cohort study 
we surveyed a little over 1600 people before and after the intervention. The interventions varied in one tribe, it was nine months and in another tribe, it was 12 months. And um, we looked at both individual sort of outcomes, you know, do people increase their fruit and vegetable purchasing and intake? And we also looked at store outcomes. Um, do they actually adhere to, what's the fidelity to the intervention? What's the dose that people are receiving? Um, hypothesizing that the more exposure you have, the more often frequently you shop at the store, the uh, we expect your behaviors, your shopping behaviors to change. So that's really what the design was. It's all of this is published. You can read about it. American Public Health, American Journal of Public Health, I think, is where that one's published. Two phase study. First phase focused almost entirely on product. We needed to make sure that we could get healthier foods there. And if you've ever tried to get, how long do fruit cups stay? You know, when you're traveling, that you've got three days on the, you know, and then the truck, and then you've got basically two days at the, so it was a lot of this pragmatic sort of taking that PhD from Berkeley and really becoming this sort of like mm, convenience store market person. You know, I was like, let's get those in caps going, you know, and um, we really, we really became um, different people <laughs> in the process of doing this. Um, we, we measured the we looked at the foods, we tested, you know, the foods, did taste tests. What would you buy? What what do you like? What would you buy? What how much should it cost? How much should it cost if you were to buy it over a hot dog? How much would it you know, and those were the and we did clicker polls. So we were really doing all of those things to accomplish securing the foods that we could get. The next phase was being able to say, okay, 10 snacks, five meals for diversity. How do you wanna put them? How do you wanna promote them? Where do you wanna place them? Um, and how much should they cost? Those are all the things that went into the RCT. This is an example of the wording and the signage. One of the tribes couldn't get healthy foods from their sources. The other tribe also had problems. They ended up changing um, sourcing and vendors and to be able to accomplish the changes, to be able to have some fresh um, salads and wraps. The Choctaw Nation ended up having to expand their stores to actually build kitchen um, prep areas. So they really made an investment in this and it took the process of understanding that the tribal Native nations' responsibilities to their citizens with regards to health were not just in a hospital setting, that they actually should be across all settings. A health in all policies perspective is what it's often called in public health. So how do you facilitate that? Um, this was an example of that. Um, I'm not going to geek out on these maps, but basically moving packaged foods um, to the back, putting a refrigerated walk around cooler in the front, moving the hot boxes or the fried foods behind the cash registers. Those kinds of logistical things are the things that we did. The findings, we were successful and we actually got our publication results or we actually got our study results when we were at that conference because I remember we were really excited about the data. Um, we did increase healthy food options measured by the Nutrition Environment Measure Survey. We did increase purchases of healthy food and self-reported intake. We did not re, um, reduce any revenue, which was a big, big bonus. That was the really main thing we were concerned about we actually increased the revenue in some stores. People bought the food. Uh, we did not see significant changes in overall dietary intake, but we didn't have anything but an environmental intervention. We didn't have any behavioral components. So we weren't too surprised at that. The biggest message is it changed policy. So the stores now permanently adopted those intervention strategies, they're still up. And the vendors that sourced 
those foods also in order to meet the study foods had to expand their options and that became a permanent expansion so the casinos the hotel the head starts all of those services now have the expanded option so it was a big policy win from food sovereignty what did we learn i will tell you because everybody always asks well did you include traditional foods at the time that we were doing this work we didn't include traditional foods because of several things in the language translation process of relearning a lot of our languages because we don't have a lot of speakers my age. Most of the speakers are older, they're elders, they're first speakers. Um, so we were like, can you translate this? And they would ask us questions back. Anybody's ever tried to learn an indigenous language knows this. You don't, you can't just translate like from Spanish to English. The translation process, I get really emotional about this. It involves concepts. It involves a heart and it, under, it involves a story. It involves relationship too. So through that process, we began to understand that you can't separate things out. So our attempts to do RCTs on some of these things might not actually be able to parse out. We also learned that you can't separate the process of making the traditional foods into a packaged version of the foods, because once you do that, once you divorce the process, you don't have the same food. It's not the same food. So as a person who's genuinely doing, in an attempt to do indigenized methodologies, we have to be honest about the challenge of this. So that's part of what we learned. The next thing, in our evolution of this is we went to, we got very lucky because we got approached by the Osage Nation and they were like, we have this land, this is a picture of the land and we wanna repurpose it for a farm. We're not traditional agriculture, agriculture society, but we live in these places where there are no grocery stores and we need to be growing our own food. And so this is a picture of Chief Standing Bear. Finally, we did, we have a way to do what we did 200 years ago, feed our own people. And that was a quote from Raymond Redcorn, who's the assistant principal chief um, of the Osage Nation. They came to us and they said, we know that this study, well, we know that this effort will probably result in improved health, but we're not scientists and we need a scientific study to be conducted on this because we are beholden to Congress. We have to be able to produce some kind of evidence to Congress that this process is worth investing in. Can you create a study that will evaluate the impact of this farm and its, you know, health uh, health impact on citizens? Of course, we were like, oh, what a dream! Because CBPR, community-based participatory researcher, the community comes to you with an idea, and you're like, oh, thank you. I don't have to. <laughs> Do I mean? <laughs> get out the epidemiologists, let's get them in there and design the study. Um, so it was great. And that's what we did. It was basically a farm to school study. We were like, how much produce can you, how much can you produce? They told us it was enough for a small population, wasn't enough for the whole community at that point. We brought the ag extension people in and said, how much would you need to produce over time to provide for this population? How much land would you need to, you know, repurpose? What other tools would you need? Um, and we also, not only that, but we went to, we took Osage Nation to different organic farms run by native people. And so we got technical assistance from Western and from native people. How do you want this to be? And so that was the planning process for the farm. And it ended up being, okay, let's supply the head starts with the food. So it was a waitlist control design. Four communities with nine head start programs were matched by size, distance, socio demographics. Um, you had to be American Indian with a child enrolled in one of the head starts, age three to five, and no plans of moving. 16 weeks, so a semester long intervention was what we planned. Um, 
and the intervention two of the communities were randomized to the intervention group two to control 193 children and we were looking at can we increase their vegetable willingness to try an intake so it's very specifically just that because it was sourcing with local food which nobody pays attention to in rcts that is the hardest part we want to intervene on social determinants of health you can't just dump a bunch of food into a community and say you've solved these problems and then the grants over and there's no sustainability so the fact that they have they built this farm was what was really the environmental and the policy intervention they did that for us we didn't have to do any thing to initiate that it was in development we designed a weekly curriculum supported staff feeding practices and menu changes and we did a passive intervention with the parents um you know here's some take home um meal kits make them with your parents and family um family fun nights, I think is what we called them, where we came together and we talked about linkages between food systems and health and their vision for um, kind of a healthier community in terms of improving food systems. The findings are, there's a lot published, but we just published the most recent findings. Um, we had a very high level of follow-up with the kids, the plate waste, um, showed significant increases in vegetable intake in the intervention group compared to control. We only focused on four vegetables and it was because of seasonality and availability. And it was also because of common understanding of these vegetables. They, they preferred these four vegetables. Um, they could buy them, they could grow them. Beans, let's see, we did squash and beans and we did peppers and spinach. So the squash and beans, we had an improvement. Um, we did not see, see the intake of spinach and peppers increased in both intervention and control groups, although the differences in intake between the groups was not significant. We used the data to advocate, we presented it in front of Congress and the Congress allocated, the Osage Congress allocated um, money for the expansion of the farm and they made it permanent policy for the farm to table um, healthy foods. So it's continued now as a policy win. So the farm sources those foods um, for the Head Starts and that continues today. Again, our work is focused on the environment and the policy. We do that because we don't wanna go in and try to, I just don't like behavior change. I don't think it works. I like changes at the pulse. You have to do both, but that's my bias. Um, what did we learn? Well, I'll tell you, we learned that the growing process is as much, is as important to the preparing and all the rest of it that happens after it. When you start the growing process, when you have your hands in the earth is the way that we say it you build a relationship with the food and that relationship is healing and it centers abundance it centers connection it centers your understanding of your place within the world and those things are what we can't get at in public health so that is one of the lessons and finally um our last, our most recent initiative from those discussions, we created the next intervention, which is another R01 that supports the CSA. So as the farm was continuing its production, and as we were having these family community meetings, we realized that we were able to go to the next stage of doing a community supported agricultural initiative. And that's what the Osage is undertaking now. We're in the process of developing it. Uh, we are doing an RCT again with 200 households. We're assessing diet, BMI, blood pressure, blood lipids among adults, diet, blood pressure, and BMI among children, 
system level factors as well. I actually don't think we're going to do, I don't think we're going to do BMI among children. We're still figuring out the different measures and we're still adding the measures now with the community. Um, that's the process that we're in right now. But these are the bulk of the clinical measures that we are going to be looking at. And we're guiding this by the principles of food sovereignty, understanding at its core food is a sacred gift. Food sovereignty has to be practiced. So it's like meditation, you know, it's a good idea, but if you don't, if you're not practicing it, it's just a theory. You have to practice it in whatever native traditions that is, whatever those traditions are in your community, in your culture. Um, strengthen self and community efficacy. We have to do our own work um, to be in good relationship with others. That was a key, that's a key part of food sovereignty is caring for yourself so that you can care for the community. And food sovereignty includes legislation and policy. That one for us is intuitive. So, you know, it, it, it the way that the history of relocation and removal, we have this constant tension to fight for control over the land in the way so we can restore these responsibilities and take care of the land. And so we have to be always thinking about this in the way that we have access to our traditional foods, we have access to our hunting and gathering privileges, we have access to clean water. So those are things that we consider as part of the social determinants of health and they have to be considered. And another thing is we now learn from other communities all the time. So we've started to work with Dream of Wild Health. They're here. They hosted us to teach us about their CSA. We have some pictures here working with them. How do we learn this? And they taught us what to do. And I wanted to quote Hope Flanagan. She said, we are lucky to be alive at this time and must be grateful for all that comes along. So having this approach of gratitude in a time when things are really feeling climate wise, you're really feeling them in the food and ag world. We can't go in and pretend like that's not a reality. So some of our work in Osage is often disrupted because of water contamination and those sites types of things. So we have that to contend with. The last uh, slide here is just a Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. This is a center that we started and was funded. And the center is not an RCT. The center is, it exists because of the genealogy of Osage and Hawaii and Alaska communities coming together, having a cross-cultural learning exchange, understanding the importance of traditional food practices on the transmission of knowledge across generations. It's not so much the knowledge as it is the securing and protection of that transmission of knowledge. We change, knowledge changes, we evolve, we grow as cultures, but we have to protect the transmission of that knowledge from generation. Because as we talked about many times, it was the break of that transmission of knowledge across generations that colonization dis destroyed. And we have to restore that if we call ourselves public health practitioners, the bare minimum we have to do is acknowledge that and elevate that. And so that's what this center does. We are forced, uh, four studies right now, or four initiatives right now. Elders mentoring elders is in Fairbanks. Many of our elders in 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 many Native communities were boarding school, um, taken to boarding schools, and this program pairs elders who have so much to teach but didn't get a chance to teach with elders who were at boarding schools and didn't get to learn and the traditional foods is what they teach them salmon cutting um smoking um moose hide those kinds of 
traditional food activities. And then um, we have a mobile market in Osage Nation. We have the Growing Hope program that I mentioned in Choctaw Nation, which is distributing seeds to Choctaw people and we grow those seeds. And we have, what is the, what is the fourth one we have? Osage, Choctaw, oh, South Central Foundation in Anchorage. That program is supporting a gathering of traditional food practitioners um, to share best practices, just in the same way that we do scientific conferences. So I emphasize this because for the, fir for the first time in a very long time in my career, I get to be unabashed in my ability to learn, just learn without testing. And that is such an incredible privilege. So we got that because of the community leadership and the genealogy of the study um, in its origin. So that's, that's the center. Mm, references are here. And I think we now have time for questions. <laughs> so do I leave this or leave it? Okay, thank you. Yes, Mindy. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was a wonderful seminar. And I think we at the University of Minnesota need to hear this. This was just great. It really was. So because you really work on this interface that's so incredibly important. Have you ever done or thought of or have other people done interventions where you've done a sort of total endpoint intervention with kids where they grow the food, where they work in the fields and grow the vegetables, and then you look at, is there more consumption? Do they get healthier? Do they develop a taste for maybe foods that they're not used to that are traditional foods? Mm -hmm. The one that I know of is one of the, it's the one that we, it's the genealogy of Sihi. So it's the Ma'o Organic Farms in Hawaii. And it was an accidental study. It was an accidental research study in the sense that the farm was started by Native Hawaiians who understood the urgent need to place their hands on the earth. And I don't know the Hawaiian, I can't repeat the Hawaiian phrase because my Hawaiian, I'll, I'll not be able to say it right. There's a phrase for it. And it's a very important phrase. They taught it to us. Basically, that is how the farm started. The farm employed um, native youth and they started to farm and through the process, their health actually got better to the point where some University of Hawaii researchers who are native Hawaiian noticed it. And Alika Manakia is the principal investigator of the study and he works with us and basically said, this is not a health intervention, but we want to assess because anecdotally BMI is reducing, um, you know, blood pressure is going down in these kids. Um, so they basically, these kids were doing the work because it was a job in exchange for college tuition, but the study showed that BMI reduced blood um, lipid panel improved, the A1C levels went down, risk of prediabetes um, went down, and the social networks of these youth even benefited. So the extra produce they were consuming, learning how to prepare, and then distributing amongst their friends in the Native Hawaiian community and their family members also led to an improvement in the community more widespread. So it's Ma'o Organic Farms and it's Alika Monakia's study um, on that program. And he studies a lot of gut microbiome. So he does, in addition to the measures, I just listed all kinds of other measures that are fascinating and um, University of Hawaii. Yes. We have an online question from Biwadron. I'm going to allow them to talk. So we'll be hearing them in the speakers. Sure. I don't know if they can hear me announcing this. Um, so we'll see how this goes. So they are now welcome to uh, unmute themselves and ask for the question here in the room. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Scan all. I am a registered dietitian from Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, I, I came on a little late, I'm sorry, because of the, um, the time or the, the link difference. Um, so I'm not sure if you uh, mentioned it, but I'd be really interested in your path um, around um, Indigenous uh, data governance uh, in the space, especially because we're talking about um, ceremonial practice surrounding food and food medicine and, and health and wellness and, and sovereignty spaces. Um, how are you or have you been able to protect um, the rights to our, our data sets um, in the research that you're, we're working with and um, you know, being able to make sure that uh, sacred knowledge and information is being potentially divvied off from public and um, population data sets and bases. Is that an opportunity or something that you've been able to explore in your work? It is, thank you for that question. That certainly is not my area of expertise. I know Stephanie Carroll at University of Arizona, that, that's a great Native Nations Institute, does wonderful seminars on, on that topic. In my own experience, I have been, that's a, that's a non-starter for me in the sense that I do not own we, when we negotiate research practices and processes, we don't, we, we understand, and these are documented in writing through our agreements that the Native nations and the Native communities own their own data. What they want to share is what they want to share and they govern that and they decide. I don't want that responsibility. At its core, I would never even, I would be terrified to even be asked to carry that responsibility. So that's not my story to tell. That's their story. That's their knowledge. I mean, Tara and I, we work on this all the time. Um, there, it's just the kind of, you know, you get it in writing. Most universities at this point in time will use the tribal, the native um, data use agreements. Some might not, but the ones that I've worked at do defer to Native um, Nations data use agreements. Not very many, but some Native Nations have institutional review boards if they do enough research. I've been involved in the process of helping get those research divisions and the IRB started in my career of 25 years now. But um, in the early days, it was less common and I know that there I defer to some of my mentors like Spiro Manson and others who had negotiated those very um, difficult um, pathways in my career. Uh, I've been fortunate to have been funded by the National Institutes of Health where we say you know we've gotten funding and the data the determination of what data is shared is always the 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 decision of the sovereign nation. These are sovereign nations. I cannot go in and ask for data. You know, it would be the equivalent to me going to, you know, Canada and asking. It's just not my place. So I've never, I've never um, been in a position where I've asked for data that wasn't something that wanted to be shared. Um, data use agreements and IRB approvals um, if there's not an IRB, the use of the Indian Health Service IR, our IRBs are an option at the EPI centers. Um, the California Rural Indian Health Board, um, I believe, was involved in some research training. Um, I don't think, I don't remember now if they have an IRB. I think they use the IHS one. Um, or the IAA, Inter, what is it, Institutional Review Board, uh, assurances agreement so you have a reliance with your university that will umbrella that native community under theirs but the data use agreements are key what data are you willing to share what data do you want to share how do you want to share it is it aggregate is it you know um do you want to share videos do you want to share pictures do you want to share stories 
And some of the data, honestly, if I'm being really honest with you, sometimes the data, we just don't, we don't want to have the responsibility of. So I'll say, you know, that's not data I want to collect. I don't collect any data that I don't feel comfortable holding, if that makes sense. And any documentary data we give back. So here's the raw footage. These are the tapes. Um, this is yours to keep. We have held um, in databases native data before, but we always give it back and we only hold it for the period of time. So it's just a responsibility that's often, you know, you know what comes with that responsibility and whether or not you're willing to hold that. And I actually don't ask questions that I don't feel comfortable um, holding either. So. I know that may limit myself as a scientist, but I don't ask questions about a lot of things. I I talk about food, <laughs> you know, but I know that that's a sensitive topic too. You have another online question from yeah. uh, Tiffany Beckman, and so I'm going to allow them to talk. I know Tiffany. Hi, Tiff. To be able to unmute and speak at any time. Hey, Valerie. Hi. Hey, Buju. Hi. No, I'm connected twice. Okay. Let me leave the one. Can you hear clearly? Yep. Okay, I want to say she may glitch for your work. Thank you very much for all that you do and keep doing it. And by all means, spread it. All reservations in the United States. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today. I'm in Bemidji. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I missed you. Called to duty. I was gonna catch a flight or drive and I'm like, yeah, right, seriously. And you need sleep, right? We all need sleep to do our work. So I'm you know, trying to direct a critical access hospital up here and learn something about leadership. And I wanna tell you, Happily, I know our tribe purchased the local grocery store. And so food sovereignty is, is going on up here too. <laughs> I'm really glad. So yeah, this is kind of a food desert up here. Um, there's a lot of fast food and a lot of garbage food. So anything that can be done to improve that access it's going to reduce the incidence and prevalence of diabetes and obesity up here. And we all know how that's going to affect the rest of, of the health. I just love what you're doing. And I want to stop talking to give everyone else a chance. Okay. So bless you on your journey. Okay. And safe travels. And I will catch you in the future. I'm sure our paths will cross. Thanks, Tiffany. Love you. <laughs> love you too. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. Tiffany is an MD. She's a native MD, MD on so the front she's lines. She's on the nutrition graduate faculty. Yeah, front lines. Yeah. Um, I, uh, some of the issues as far as the severe health disparities that are for native versus non-native populations. Um, is there ever been any study that you're aware of or any, any look into how many of those people are on reservation that are focused that are solely surviving off commodities, and if there would be a correlation between uh, commodity consumption and these drastic health issues with type two diabetes, those types of things that <clears throat> are on reservations where the only food source is typically commodities. Wow, that's the way you framed it. I don't think that there has actually been a specific study <laughs> that looked at okay, you're a population, how much of your food do you consume that comes solely from commodities and what are your health outcomes? There have been separate right. sorts of studies. The general biggest study that I've seen is that for the native communities that receive commodities that are on reservations, the population that uses those as their primary source of food is 50% or more. Now that's strikingly high. And I don't have the source for that. Um, I don't remember the study, but I can find it and put it on our website with the actual paper. 
The next thing I know is that you have the association between the consumption and you have the, the terrible health outcomes. So you don't have correlation. You, you have correlation, but you don't have causation. So I don't know, Mindy or Tara, do you know, or anyone else know of, is there something? So there's a little bit, somebody recently did a nutrient analysis of all the federally supported nutrition programs. And I live in a health care program, there's a food distribution program at the Indian Reservation, so I feel like some of those HEI scores in federal nutrition support program. And so we've seen a lot of good things in here, wild rice, now the USDA is doing food, and things like that, but there's still, you're right, there's a lot of like association, it's not just great. Yeah, um, and so one point. study I worked on, participants that used to differ or not, actually had better life quality than people that did not. But there are issues, and of course, food is better than no food, right? But yeah, there's there's a lot of work to be done. But there's a lot of activism that came from grassroots community folks to do that. And it started to change in the last like 10, 12 years or something. Yeah. Well, in the last farm bill, there was a uh, there were money uh, given for some uh, some practice programs with a few tribes who could incorporate traditional foods into the Fadipa program. Yep. And now a lot of tribes want to get into it, and there's some activism for the next farm bill, which is coming up, to increase that program so that it's not just a few tribes. And it would be interesting think about this, that to do a study where you're comparing. Uh, tribes that have managed to integrate traditional foods into the Padipa program with those that, that have not and are really still consuming all the commodity foods. Interesting. Or within a tribe, if 50% of the people are using the Padipa and 50% are not, there are those folks. Yes. So maybe 10, 12 years ago, it was really bad. It has improved. That's about the time I remember people hearing it, or, and I remember hearing elders bringing it up. I don't know that it ever got anywhere because you're saying that well, this is the only food you want to put the ingredients on. What's in it? <laughs> Other than tea, <laughs> chicken, you know, salmon, you know, what's in these things that, you know, and why, I mean, why is there such a high variance of type 2 diabetes that caught epidemic? And I'm from Pine Ridge, and that's, when you got 20 year old kids that are type 2 diabetic, you know, and that's not normal. You know, the only variance that we know of, other than living on a reservation, is just. You know, and like I said, there are people who were bringing it up when I was young, but you know, it's not a path that I was able to you know, cling to or even hear in my old job since you passed on. Mm -hmm. Curiosity kind of told me that. Kind of mm -hmm. to, and I've never been able to talk to anybody that is in a position that could have the, the type of answers that would be Craig and then Andrew. Yeah, I. I'd like to ask if you see or if there was a role for cerebellus in these studies and should there be or how would that? Mm -hmm. There is a, there is definitely a role for ceremonies in these studies. And I think ceremony would be at its heart of the, of the work and of the study from all levels of practicing ceremony from offering tobacco to actually a large community wide ceremony. That is part of the restoration work. We have not looked at that in studies, partly because of the sensitivity and the responsibility. There are some studies out there that do, for example, Kiave, how do I say this last time? Um, Kahala Ua. He's a fabulous Native Hawaiian researcher. He does hula research and his research is on the traditional movement practices, which is really all ceremony of hula. But in the research studies, it's sort of a physical activity. It actually showed to reduce blood pressure at rates better than medications. He had this just, I keep saying, thinking like, I mean, off the charts success on the study that nobody expected from NHLBI. And it was a big, big deal a few years ago back. And, um, but 
But Native Hawaiian folks that I work with will say that is a different type of hula than ceremonial. And so could we? And those are the questions that the community would have to advise and decide. I don't know, but it is a very important thought and idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. One more, and Andrew. So we have another online question from Chase Warner. I'm going to allow them to unmute and talk whenever they would like now. I'm JC. I'm a native nutrition student at the U, and I was just wondering if you know of any resources for learning indigenous agriculture or gardening practices, because I unfortunately don't know anyone who could teach me, and I think it would be really useful in my honors thesis. Hmm. Well, individual community members were how I learned. My, my own personal way was learning from individual community members. But I think, and I learned growing practices and um, then at different conferences, specifically Mindy, your um, healthy um, native conference, I learned from a presentation given by, is it Jane Mount Pleasant? Yes. <sighs> this is just agricultural practices. That, presentation really changed my life. And I think that was in 2018 and really kicked off the pursuit of your very question. How will I find this for myself? And so, I mean, look within your own community, look within these conferences, talk to them, ask them. There is the intertribal um, ag council that, and native, there's there's native, any others, Mindy and Tara, that you can think of? The um, Great Lakes Indigenous Food Sovereignty Symposium last this past year at Happened Open Day in Wales, Michigan. And that was very practice based. You go, you like make some rice corn, you're grading corn, you're doing all this like hands on food stuff and there's academic stuff too, but that's also put on by intertribal ag council. So we're to email me. Email Mindy Curser and she can help you. Today is volunteer day and for you of wild health. Yes. That's a good one. Yes. And there's planting on the 12th on the 17th. Planting on the 12th. So there are a lot of other things. Those are great suggestions if you heard, because those are ways that you can just practice. You can learn and you can get to meet elders and community members. And you will find that your own personal depression and anxiety, not that you, I go, I have it, um, you know, goes down as a benefit if you're interested. Yeah, thank you, Miigwech. Thank you. One more question? Oh, good. Oh, one more question. Oh, that's lovely. Emily Chan has a question online. I will allow them to talk now. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm from Esquinan, also known as San Isla Reservation, here in San Diego, California. Uh, my what I wanted to mention and kind of bring up because it's been mentioned throughout this discussion and even with the audience questions, but is the not only how food sovereignty plays the importance role of the nutrition value side of things, but like the uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, um, you know, uh, sustenance that it, it, that spiritual food that it gives us as well. And uh, because here where I am, rural area, not a lot of resources, um, we actually don't even have a space where we can gather as a community anymore. Um, so we started the community garden and we see a lot of unlearning now. I see it anyway with the assimilation way of thinking. We're heavily influenced by the mission slave system here in California. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of lateral violence way of thinking and doing things um, and unlearning that, right? That importance of unlearning that way of thinking and reconnecting to mat or the earth and uh, reconnecting with our body mat and then reconnecting with each other as a community. I see that, like you said, um, the first, I guess you could say resource, <laughs> I don't like that word for, uh, to learn is your people. So that's, yeah, what I did was I seeked out the elders or the, not even just elders, but the uh, younger folks even who are 
growing. And then, so that opens that door of communication, starting that relationship that I never really had once with those folks and then helping others start gardens, um, you know, opens up that relationship with them. So it's like a full circle ongoing uh, thing, how you mentioned, uh, I like to think of food sovereignty as a verb rather than a noun. Um, I mean, uh, you know what I mean? Like it has to be in motion for it to actually be a, a thing or something like that. But that's just what I wanted to touch on because that's what I'm finding here is that work's being done. Like uh, I was thinking, oh, we we're going to revitalize this space, grow some, some relatives, some seeds, but all I then all these other things came with it. So I just wanted to bring that up too. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And I love that. And you made me remember um, to thank, you made me remember to say one of the first lessons I learned when I was relearning this was um, taught to me by uh, Kukui Manakia, who actually started Ma'o Farms. And she told me, she said, the land loved you first. So, so I just offer that to you. The land loved you first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Valerie yeah. for this wonderful talk. Thank you all for sticking around a little bit longer because we had so many questions. Um, did Andrew, did you record the seminar? Yeah. So this, so the seminar was recorded. If you want to watch it again, if you want to show it to your friends, to your colleagues, to your classes, please use it and, uh, and spread the word and Valerie, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for yourself, thank for you. your heart, for your work. Me too. You're wonderful. Thank you, Sadie. The feelings mutual. The feelings mutual. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.